Ethan Zuckerman is uh, the director of the Center for Civic Media at MIT and associate professor of the practice at MIT's Media Lab. Ethan is a writer, a blogger, a researcher, but most importantly, he is a humanist and a unique visionary. So we are very happy, we have a huge pleasure to have such a keynote speaker at PDF this year. I'm very, very glad to be with you, even virtually. And uh, I'm going to take the phones because I just hear my, my own voice here. Um, and it's almost me if uh, things are going horribly wrong. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I just want to say hi, particularly now that I know uh, that the parties keep getting better uh, uh, at PDFCE. I'm, I'm particularly sad not to be there in person. Um, but I have a lot that I hope we can talk about. And so maybe if my slides uh, that I want to say is, is I want to talk about some just in the world. And I'm really hoping to get feedback uh, from my friends in Central and Eastern Europe. So uh, tweet to me, to tell me I have it right or whether I have it wrong or whether these ideas uh, make any sense. Um, so on that side, uh, I want to talk about what I'm calling a world turned upside down. Uh, and I think what's happened to uh, us in the last couple of years is that a lot of big trends, the trends of heading towards a more global world, heading towards a more connected world, uh, are starting to reverse a little bit. And we're starting to head uh, towards a more nationalist, and towards a more isolationist world. So if you can give me the next slide, please. Um, one of the things that, that's interesting to know is that while some of us noticed this trend uh, when it started coming uh, to the U when it started coming to the US, actually Central and Eastern Europe has been a real leader uh, in this space. I don't think that's something to, to celebrate, uh, but I think it's that we have uh, maybe special insight from this region on what's going on. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we've seen, of course, uh, that, that my country now, as we often like to do, is trying the lead at nationalist, isolationist, closed uh, and generally reversing a lot of the democratic progress that we've seen over many years. Next slide, please. Um, I think that we should be shocked by what's going on, but I think it would be a mistake to be surprised by what's going on. I think a lot of these trends have been coming uh, for five or 10 years, and now we're just starting to see where they end up. Next slide, please. Um, Hayes, uh, who is a commentator uh, in the United States, he writes, uh, he, he speaks for MSNBC, wrote an excellent book uh, called Twilight of the and book, he talks about this idea that left and right in politics makes less sense now than this idea of institutionalist and insurrectionist. Institutionalists are people who feel like the basic institutions of society are still working for most of us, and we just need to make them stronger, we need to make them more robust. Insurrectionists are people who feel like we just have to throw this all out and that we have to start with something different. That the institutions are so big that we actually need to th think about building new institutions or getting in rid of institutions altogether. Next slide, please. This all, for me, connects to a loss of trust of people not just in their governments, but in institutions of society as a whole. So this is data from the United States. This is a survey that the Pew Research Center asks a couple of times every year. And they ask people, do you trust the government in Washington to do the right thing? If you go back to 1964, 77% of Americans said they trusted the government in Washington to do the right thing all or most of the time. And you can see it's been on a slide ever since. Now it's down around 15% uh, in the Obama administration. It may be even lower in the Trump administration. Next slide, please. 
it's not just government that we're losing trust in. In the US, we've lost trust in all of our major institutions. We've had increased trust in the military and in small business, but everything else, the police, the government, banks, university, the media, newspapers, anything that is big enough that it doesn't have a face, but we think of it as an entity rather than as individuals, our trust in it is decaying over the last 20 or 30 years. Next slide, please. This isn't just in the United States, and it's very important to understand that. This looks like it's a global phenomenon. So the U.S. in the grand scheme of things is actually sort of in the middle of the pack as far as trust. There's a lot of European nations that are even lower in trust. According to the Edelman Trust Index, actually Poland was the lowest trust country of anyone that they surveyed. Poland has actually gone up slightly in trust, but it's still very much in this pack of distrusters. And Edelman is, again, they're not just looking at government. They're looking at all sorts of institutions, from everything from the news to church to universities. We seem to have lowered trust. Next slide. This is the slide that's the most scary for me, because this is recent research that suggests that when you go into these different countries, when you go into the US and the Netherlands, Great Britain, and you ask people, do you think it's very important to live in a democracy? More and more of them are saying no. The way to read these graphs is this was a question asked for people who were born in the 1930s, born in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s. That's how to read the graph. So for my grandparents, it was very important to live in a democracy. For my parents, maybe a little bit less important. For my generation, less important. And now for the kids that I teach at MIT, significantly less important. Somehow we're losing faith in these institutions of democracy that many of us in this room have really sort of dedicated ourselves to strengthen and build. Next slide, please. Everyone wants to ask the question, why are we losing confidence in institutions? And I think there's a lot of reasons. Um, one of the reasons that's been suggested is that with the digital press, with the rise of anyone being able to write online, um, we have filter bubbles. We have people isolated in their own media universes. We have whistleblowers who are able to challenge established narratives. We have fake news that's coming in and complicating all of our discussions. Um, I think a much more realistic picture of this is not actually blaming these three factors. It may be blaming the fact that we are better educated, we are more critical, we are less likely just to sort of align ourselves with these institutions uncritically. Um, but I also think there's another reason we're losing this confidence. Next slide, please. I think these institutions aren't doing very well for us much of the time. Um, that photo on the left there is a photo of Syrian refugees. We're facing a, a global crisis with refugees, and, and frankly, none of our governments are doing particularly well, particularly mine is doing a terrible job. Um, we saw a crisis in global financial markets in 2007, 2008, where it turned out that this unregulated hypercapitalism that reigns in the United States um, had the chance to crash the entire global economy. More than anything else, we have this problem of inequality. Uh, which continues to rise globally to the point where we have 62 billionaires uh, who own as much wealth as essentially half of the globe. These systems, these institutions, aren't working well for all of us. And in some ways, this reaction of loss of faith is perfectly appropriate and perfectly reasonable. The problem is this high level of mistrust can be really paralyzing and really dangerous for us. Next slide, please. It's not hard to feel helpless. 
if you're at a point where you feel like government's not doing its job, the media is not doing its job, the easiest thing to do in some ways is to back away from all of this and to sort of, you know, go into a shell and not pay attention to the outside world. Um, and there's some logic to this. Next slide. Um, if you don't feel like government is doing a very good job of representing your interests, if you feel like it's dysfunctional, if you feel like it's been captured, voting doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, in my country, con uh, Congress, our legislative branch, has about a 9% uh, public confidence rating it's very hard to motivate people to go vote for Congress because Congress doesn't really do anything. It feels helpless, it feels paralyzed. But what's really hard about this is voting is the center of what most of us think of as democratic practice. If voting's not helpful, then what do we do as civic actors? Next slide. One of the things we do is we protest. Uh, we go out into the streets, we raise our voices, and this is very important. I, I've been watching uh, with great interest the protests in Hungary uh, against the closure of Central European University. Uh, we've been seeing uh, protests in the Balkans. Uh, protest is incredibly important, but we're also starting to see the limitations of it. Uh, we saw with the protests in Gezi Park in Turkey if the government's really been captured, if you really have authoritarians in place, they may simply ignore the protest knowing that you're not strong enough to chase a government out. I like to say uh, to US audiences, um, our culture of protest comes out of a big civil rights movement called the March on Washington. The problem is if you don't trust Washington, if you don't believe that Washington can make change, marching on them isn't very helpful. Next slide. So the other thing that mistrust can do is it can lead us to authoritarianism. So if we don't trust these institutions anymore, it's not hard for our response to be to look for someone who promises us that they're going to find the way out of the puzzle. They're going to be able to ignore and sweep aside these institutions and make the change that we're looking for. Next slide. So when you look at, uh, one more slide, please. We don't need to see that much Trump. Oh no, more Trump. Um, so when you think about what Donald Trump promised in the United States, it's really been about throwing out institutions. He took this approach where he basically battled his own political party uh, and seized control over it. And he hasn't really been for anything. He's been against everything. He's been against immigrants. He's been against the media. His whole narrative has been basically saying, all these systems are broken. And if you elect me, I'm going to throw them out and something very new is going to happen. Next slide. We just did a very big research study uh, with Yohai Benkler over at Harvard University. Uh, this is work that comes out of my lab. We analyze um, millions of media sources. Uh, this is a bit over a million news stories over the 18 months of the US election. Uh, and then we sorted them to see what was the media that was influential online. These are basically the sources that people tweeted about, and these are ways in which uh, public conversation happened over the very long US election. Next slide. At the very center of this dialogue is sort of mainstream US media, things like the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, groups that you've probably heard of. Um, but when you look to the right side of the equation, the people who supported Donald Trump, they weren't reading any of these things. Uh, they were reading Breitbart. They were reading um, this quite new publication um, that really is completely disconnected from everything else we have in the media narrative. Next slide, please. This was a way of looking at from left to right all these different media outlets. And you can see that sort of the mainstream press in the US, things like the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, 
They're very popular. They get looked at by a lot of things, but they're mostly getting looked at by the left and the center left. Even things that we tend to think of as conservative journalism in the U.S. is now right in the middle. The Wall Street Journal is right there in sort of the middle of this. And then all the way over to the right is Breitbart. Next slide. It's almost like we have a normal distribution from left to right to media. And then we have this far right that has come up and come up very, very recently. Next slide. Pretty much everything on this far right in the media is brand new. It actually came as part of the digital age. Um, this stuff came up in the last 10 years. Breitbart's only about 10 years old. And almost all of the other sites within this orbit, with the exception of Fox News, they're also roughly 10 years old. And what happened is this new media, this very fearful, very authoritarian, very anti-immigrant media, ended up essentially taking over media as we know it in the, in the US. Next slide. When we analyzed what people actually talked about in the 2016 election, they really talked about two things. They talked about Clinton scandals, and this was the press being on the attack. But when you look in the middle, these are the, the serious issues of the campaign. And the main issue that got discussed was immigration. Now, what's interesting is that immigration isn't the main issue on most Americans' minds. A Americans mostly care about the economy. Uh, but immigration is what the far right cared about. Next slide. You can see that Breitbart talked more about immigration than anybody else there. And so what basically happened was this far right party captured the dialogue. They said, we're not going to talk about the economy anymore. We're going to talk about immigration. Immigration is the problem. And what we need to find is the one person who can solve our problem. So we're going to elect the guy who's going to build the wall. Next slide. You're going to have to click twice to, to get Trump on this. One more. Um, so here's the thing. Authoritarians thrive when the world really complicated when it's really hard to figure out where to go because they come in and they say, look, I've got a simple solution. I know you don't trust the government. I know you don't trust the media. I know you don't trust these institutions. Trust me, here's the simple solution. Close our borders, make our nation strong again, and everything's gonna be just fine. So here's the question. We need a third option. Next slide, please. We need something that gets us beyond either backing away from civics or moving towards embracing authoritarianism. And so what I'm really interested in is whether the people at PDF can help us think about what's this new civics? What does it look like? And I wanna give three suggestions of what I think the new civics might look like. Next slide, please. So one way to understand what happened in my country is in terms of the left and the right. The right won, the left lost, but I, I think that's wrong. I think what happened was actually much more complicated. Next slide. We actually were supposed to have a presidential race behind Hillary Clinton in the bottom left and Jeb Bush in the bottom right. Neither of these guys are radical. They're both institutionalists. They're the sort of people that for if you think the institutions of government are working out just fine. But then Donald Trump, backed by Breitbart, shows up in that upper right corner. This is an insurrectionist. This is someone who says, everything's broken. We got to throw out these institutions. We got to start from scratch. He's an insurrectionist from the right. It raises a question, what would insurrection from the left look like? Next slide. So there was the possibility that you could have someone like Bernie Sanders, who sort of claimed to be an insurrectionist. But it's hard because Bernie Sanders has spent his entire life in government. So it's hard to take him seriously as a radical. What you might really expect is something more like the Occupy movement. People coming in and essentially saying, we know the system is broken, 
what we want is progressive social change. We're going to put something different in place. And we see this energy. We see this with Podemos in Spain. We see left-wing insurrectionist movements rising everywhere. What's interesting is that in Europe, sometimes folks make it into the institutions and are trying to sort of change them from within. In my country, there simply has been no one who's succeeded in insurrection from the left. But I'm also worried that insurrection may not work as well for the left as for the right. Next slide. Now, remember, I'm showing you Donald Trump's secret agenda. It's written in his own handwriting here, so you can tell signed by him, so we know that this is Donald Trump's. His ultimate ambition here, and the ambition of his advisors, is to dismantle the government. And this is very much a, a right-wing project, to try to get government to be weaker, to try to get the individual leader to be stronger. For the left, usually, we're looking for stronger government, we're looking for public services, we're looking for public goods. It may be that insurrectionism doesn't work as well for us as we would hope. So what else can we try? Next slide. A guy that I'm spending a lot of time reading and thinking about is Pierre Rossenvallon. He's a, a French scholar, and he puts forward this idea called counter-democracy. He actually goes back to the French Revolution to look for ways that rebellious citizens could try to make democracy stronger. Next slide. His theory for this is that counter-democracy almost works like a buttress on a cathedral. It presses against democracy, it puts pressure on it, and it makes it stronger and makes it able to stand up harder. Next slide. So this means things like surveillance, watching the government, trying to think about how we can watch and make sure that people are living up to their promises. All this energy we've had in our movement around things like transparency, around things like watching the government, sort of fits within this frame. Next slide. I like using this idea of monitorial citizenship that one of our big responsibilities as citizens is to monitor these institutions that watch us. And this is something that, that actually has a very proud history uh, in my country. This is a picture of the Black Panthers who ended up being uh, quite a radical and revolutionary civil rights group, but who started with the practice of monitoring the police in Oakland, California, where they were committing a lot of abuses. That was sort of their first practice that they got started with. And it sounds crazy, but they would literally drive around four guys in a car following police officers. When police officers would stop a civilian, four guys would get out of the car with guns to watch the police and make sure that they were doing their job correctly. So this doesn't have to be passive. It doesn't have to be quiet. It can actually be quite radical. Next slide. We see this happening a lot in the U.S. through a movement called Cop Watch. And this has been a very important movement because, of course, we still have terrible problems of racial violence in the United States. And letting the police know that civilians are watching actually turns out to be very powerful. We've had incidents like the shooting of Walter Scott, which we see on the left, which only got prosecuted because citizens were watching. But this also doesn't have to be as radical. Next slide. Uh, my friend Luigi Reggi um, started an amazing project in Italy called Monathon. What he wanted to do is start something that was like a hackathon, but for people who didn't know how to program. And so Monathon invited people to monitor government efforts. In fact, what it specifically invites people to do is monitor how EU cohesion funds are being spent. We know that there's a feeling that the EU doesn't do anything. There's a, a loss of interest in the EU. Maybe this money isn't being spent very well. Luigi wanted people to go out and actually see how this money was being spent. Next slide. And so what teams of high school students go out and do is go visit things in their community, do interviews, fill out this whole form, and give a score. And in many cases, what they find is that the program is working better than they thought. It actually ends up sort of increasing 
their confidence in institutions rather than tearing it down even further, which is often a problem in our transparency efforts. We're very good at talking about malfeasance. We're very good at talking about what's gone wrong. The last time I was in Ukraine, I was thrilled to see how strong these transparency efforts were. But of course, a lot of what they were doing was revealing just how flawed the government was and just how deep the trouble was. And if part of our problem is our loss of confidence in these institutions, it's interesting to ask, is this making better or making it worse? So I wanna talk about the third path for progressive insurrectionists. I wanna talk about the part that I am in many ways most excited about, next slide. So my friend Larry Lessig wrote a book uh, almost 20 years ago now uh, called Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace. And it's an important book for all sorts of reasons, but one of the most important pieces of it is this idea, this idea that when we control society, we can actually do it through at least four different ways. We can pass laws to make things legal or illegal, we can use markets to make things expensive or cheap. My country makes cigarettes very expensive to try to reduce smoking. We can use code. We can use technology to make things easy or hard to do. And we can use social norms to make things popular or unpopular to do. Next slide. All the work that my lab has been doing is trying to understand that these are also all paths to social change. You can make change by passing a law. You can make uh, abortion legal or illegal. You can make gay marriage legal or illegal. But you can make change different ways as well. You can make changes in the markets. You can make changes through code. And really critically, you can make changes through norms. So let me give you some examples of this. Next slide. You may have noticed my country's government, not even under Trump, under Obama, um, is very interested in what people in Eastern Europe have to say. In fact, we're so interested in your opinions that we've started tapping your phones and reading your email. Uh, me, I, I know you appreciate us paying attention to you. Um, so obviously, I'm pretty pissed off about this, about uh, the NSA surveillance, uh, about all of these things that Snowden very bravely revealed. But even under Obama, a progressive president, we couldn't get meaningful change around this. Certainly not going to get change uh, from Donald Trump around this. Next slide. But we may find other ways to challenge this. Um, friends who are working on things like Signal, so that we have really highly secure text messaging. Friends who work on things like Tor, so that we can cover our traces as we use the internet. If we can't make change through law, and in this case we probably can't, maybe we can make change through code. Next slide. We've got the Trump administration which doesn't believe in climate change. They're not gonna take any steps to reduce carbon emissions, but we have people trying to build electric cars that are not only uh, very efficient and lower in carbon emission, uh, but are dead sexy. Uh, and so by trying to make them extremely popular, folks like Elon Musk are use markets as a path towards change. Next slide. A lot of what we work on in my group at MIT is this notion of how we make change through norms. So this um, is an image of Michael Brown. Uh, Michael Brown was a young man in Ferguson, Kansas. Um, he was shot by police uh, who claimed that he was threatening them, uh, and he was left, uh, his dead body was left for four hours in the summer sun. And this helped spark uh, the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States. Next slide. Here's an example of how Black Lives Matter has been trying to use norms to address racism in the United States. It's not easy to address racism using law as your tool for change. It's been illegal for the police to kill black people for quite some time. Uh, but what's happening is that police in the United States and many people in the United States tend to see young black men as threatening. And so what a lot of audiences did is try to get people to question What's the imagery that gets used when we talk about people like Michael Brown? 
So this image all the way on the left of the screen, that's the image that got used to portray Michael Brown after his death. It's an image from Mike Brown's Facebook page. It's shot from below, so Mike looks very tall. He looks threatening. He kind of looks badass or gangsta. He's showing a peace sign, but it looks like it could be a gang sign. And he looks intimidating. And that's the picture that people chose to use to portray a murder victim. What activists started saying was, well, why didn't you use this other picture? This other picture was available on Facebook. Mike Brown looks like a kid. He's got a chubby face, wearing headphones. He looks like a guy you might want to hang out with. And so they put this up and they said, if you died, what picture would the media use? And then people turned this into a campaign called, if they gunned me down, what picture would they use? And people started going onto their Facebook feeds and looking for an image of them, looking very respectful, like the US Marine here, and also looking very controversial, like the guy flipping the finger here. Next slide. So this blew up. There were something like 30,000 pairs of photos on Tumblr. You saw it become a major meme. You can see this young woman essentially saying, hey, white people, please stay out of this. What you had were white kids showing themselves drunk and then showing themselves in graduation garb. She was trying to make the argument that this was actually very political and very important. Next slide. Three days into the campaign, there's a story on the front page of the New York Times, probably the best respected, best read newspaper in the United States, essentially saying, this is a campaign to challenge these stereotypes. And the really interesting thing about this is that it worked. Next slide. You can't find that first picture of Michael Brown anymore. It's very hard to find. You can see one small version of it. People started portraying Michael Brown differently. Now, this isn't going to fix racism overnight, but this is a way that people were able to try to shape norms. They were able to take this unwritten rule of how we portray people and put a new rule in place. And as we've seen more people killed by police, we see newspapers being far more careful about what imagery they use. They understand that this is important. So we go back to these, these four levers, right, of law, of code, of markets, and of norms. And what I believe with this is that we're going to find ways to reform these institutions or sometimes build new institutions. We can build newspapers that are less racist, and they're going to help us sort of deal with the problem of racism. We can build communication tools that are more secure, and they're going to help us deal with things like privacy. We can deal with uh, problems like climate change in part by starting to build marketplace solutions. But we've got to find a way to commit to building these new sorts of institutions. So next slide. So for those of us who are frustrated at this moment in time, and believe me, I am one of these people who is deeply frustratedly worried, I think there's three things we can do aside from giving up and letting the authoritarians have it or just hiding away. I think we can think about, can we find our own insurrectionist leaders? Can we overthrow the system from the left? And is that really what we want to do or is that more damaging? We can try to monitor the system. We can try to oversee it. We can watch it very carefully and let that be part of how we have power. And the last thing we can do is we can try to find ways to build our own systems, to build our own alternatives, not just through electing people and passing laws, but using code, using markets, using norms, using all these tools we have to make change. Next slide. The one thing we can't do is give in to mistrust. We've got to help people feel effective so we can harness this frustration, this energy, this passion that's animating all of us. One of the most amazing things about this moment in time is that people are riled up. They want to make change. They want things to be different. And it's our job, all of us in this room, to think about how do we harness this energy and this mistrust, and how do we help people make change? Final slide, please. 
So thank you so much. It's just been an honor to be with you. I'm so grateful for this chance. I hope we have a chance to do some questions. Thank you so much for listening. And thanks to everybody in this hall for the work that you do and the passion that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eton. All right. Do you hear me? Hi, it's Christoph again. Do you hear me? I can hear you, Christoph. Yes. Pepe, how are you it's doing? Good to hear your voice. Good. It was. Thank you for that. It was. Uh, it was a great. Uh, I think uh, summarizing also of what we did during the uh, the whole um, uh, the whole forum. And uh, this is. So I'm not talking about it because you told everything that, that like interests me and I interest people. I think and very motivating. But now this is the time to get the microphones. Can I ask you guys to take uh, microphones and ask um, and take some questions from the public? All right. Ready for that? So, who wants to Wonderful. ask the question? Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, so, I'm Sergeus from Transparency International Lithuania, which means that I'm from Lithuania, just next door to Poland. Um, and I have a question about what you just said uh, in terms of, you know, how to choose, choose pick and choose, because uh, sure you can uh, uh, make um, some kind of initiative, uh, you can uh, uh, set up uh, some sort of a plan and an action, but how do you prioritize? Because you cannot do everything, and if you have to choose one or two things that you would be looking at as a civic activist or an NGO person, uh, what should you think of and what questions should you ask yourself? So for me, the questions are, what are you passionate about, and where do you think you can be the most effective? I think if you try to analyze and say, here's the most important thing, here's the place that should be the highest priority, but I'm not passionate about it, it's very hard to get yourself to work. I think the second thing is that you have to figure out where do you have power to move the dial. So if you work on a problem where you're gonna have no progress over 20 or 30 years, you're gonna get very, very frustrated. Whereas if you can find a way to work where you can see progress over time and where your skills can really be effective and can really push things forward, you've got a much better chance of sort of making progress. So I, I don't recommend trying to analyze the world and saying, this is the most important problem, this is what I'm gonna fix. What I would rather do is sort of look and say, here are the issues that I really care about, here's what I know how to do to make change, and here's where I feel like I could have a really big effect. You talked a lot about mistrust as a main variable to, that we can work on and then we can fix, but also I wanted to ask you what about fear? Because fear is a really also counterpart of trust. It's also been used a lot, and it's been tackled by several right-wing uh, movements. So how can we do this from a leftist point of view and also uh, insurrectionist point of view? Yeah. So that, that's really helpful, thank you. And I was talking about mistrust the other day with some people in the United States. And I talked about this idea that mistrust can turn into fear. And my friends in the United States said, mm, I don't believe it, you know. Um, yes, maybe I don't trust the government, but I don't fear them. For me, I work all over the world. I, I work on human rights issues. And I know that a government that you trust may turn into a government that you fear. And, and that mistrust can actually be sort of a first step towards a government that you actually fear. And so I think the first thing is that institutions that have their power through fear are fundamentally illegitimate. That in a democracy, we deserve institutions that have our support and respect, but that they don't earn it by generating fear. So once you have fear, it's a good indication that we're sort of beyond just monitoring and influencing that institution.
that's probably an institution that needs to go, that we need to challenge. At the same time, it's also exactly the same institutions that are the hardest to challenge because they have real power and they have real danger. One of the things to remember is that these institutions rely on legitimacy. They rely on this idea that they are supposed to have the power. And one of the most powerful things we can do is withdraw our consent and essentially say, you don't deserve to have this power over us anymore. You don't deserve to rule us anymore. You don't deserve our fear. It doesn't defang those institutions, but it gets rid of the legitimacy of those institutions. And I think to a large extent, this is what happened with the Tahrir rebellion. I, I think there's really interesting questions about to what extent is Sisi gaining legitimacy by not having that same sort of widespread protest and that withdrawal of implicit authority. So it's incredibly hard. And I think understanding that fear can prevent us from taking a lot of these steps, but that fear is also the indication that that institution is illegitimate and that we have to pull our support from it is very powerful. Hi, um, I'm from the Czech Republic, living in France. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, you said that the main uh, media, the right side media in the US, they are new. Uh, they are they're here because we have new technologies and and we were as well discussing all together that we live in bubbles. We we are in a small bubble here as well, and um, people they live in bubbles and they share the information in the bubbles. How we can reach uh, these bubbles that we are not connected? That's my question. Yep. So this question of media echo chambers is really powerful and really important. I think that the reason that the right wing press in the United States has been so effective is that it's not just one voice. It's 20, 30, 50, 100 of these news outlets. So you try to check to see if one's correct and there's another 20 that say that Obama's the secret Muslim and uh, Hillary Clinton dropped sarin personally on, on Syria. Um, and, and so this is all a function of getting stuck within that small media universe. There's a combination of responsibilities here. There's personal responsibility I spend too much time reading left-wing press. I spend too much time reading US press. One of the reasons I helped cope found Global Voices was so I would get better at reading some of the rest of the world. So some of this can be personal responsibility. How do we do a better job in our own sort of media diets paying attention to the world? Some of it is platforms. Um, we need our news organizations, our newspapers, to be much more sensitive to what they're covering and what they're not covering, trying to give us more of a global view. And we need platforms like Facebook, not just to worry about fake news, but to worry about helping introduce us to people who have different perspectives, not just left versus right, but local versus global. And this is a place where something like Facebook or Twitter could be incredibly powerful by introducing us to people who we don't know and who are gonna challenge what we think about and give us a wider view. So I think it's both personal and technological. I also think there's a norms piece to it. I think um, we need it to be deeply unpopular to be isolated within one of those bubbles. We need it to be cool, to be global, to be interconnected in one fashion or another, and, and to try to deal with that norm side of the equation as well.
Hi, uh, I'm Alex from Poland. Uh, I have a question about leaders. Uh, there was this graph that you showed, and there was Bernie Sanders and the question marks. And I have a question um, because you suggested uh, the Occupy movement. Is it possible, in your opinion, that um, there is a movement or a group that brings about real change that doesn't have a leader? And you also talked about Podemos. Uh, we have the Razem Together Party in, in Poland. They obviously have leaders, uh, but they also work in certain political canvas where they are parties, they're not movements. Um, and I'm also thinking about this question in a sense that um, we often have these um, individual political candidates that are not, they're anti-institutionalist, and that's fine, and um, they, they sometimes win elections, um, but they often lack this kind of experience um, in institutions or in, um, in education, whereas the movements, they are made up of many people who together have this added value of, of many different educations, many different institutions, experiences, so that might actually be better. So I'm, I'm just kind of wondering, is it yeah. possible in your opinion to not have a leader and still make a change? Yeah. So it's really interesting. Um, I get much more feedback about political parties and their power and leaderless institutions when I talk to Europeans than when I talk to North Americans. I think part of it is that political parties are comparatively weak in the US and they tend to get really hijacked by personalities. So I'm showing my American bias when I'm talking more about individual leaders than I am about parties. In my defense, a lot of what I'm really talking about is sort of narrative. Like what's the story that we want to believe? And when we tell stories, those stories almost always have characters. So Donald Trump is a character. And, and he's a character that symbolizes a very particular approach to government. And Hillary Clinton was very much a character that symbolized a certain approach to government. The big problem that Occupy had in the United States with media is that no one understood how to tell their story. And so US media looked at Occupy and basically said, we'll take this seriously when someone puts a leader on top of it. I think leaderless movements are possible. I think even more likely are ideological movements that have lots of different leaders and lots of different figures within them. Um, but I think it's harder. I think in many ways it's much easier to put forward that single figure who leads a movement than to get people to think about the method of cooperation so I think you could even make the argument that progressive power has to come from that process and from that openness and from that debate. But I also think we have to acknowledge that this makes our struggle harder in some ways. Because one of the easiest ways to tell the story is with that character of the leader. So we have to decide, is, is our aspiration towards leaderlessness so strong that we're willing to sacrifice that character? Or can we build movements that are inclusive and participatory, but also have avatars, really powerful figures that sort of self-identify and that we use to, to tell the story about our values? Hi, Ethan. I'm Anna. I'm from Chicago, so I'm quite relatable to you about the USA. Um, I have a question because today we've been talking about fact-checking a lot, so this is obviously something that's very good for us with Donald Trump, as we can go through his tweets and we can say that this is clearly more biased and opinion views, but something we went over as well that was very hard for us to define was the fact that most of the people who support Trump are people who are not going to really care about the fact checking anyway. These are kind of, we know that these are people that kind of believe Michelle Obama's a man and all other kind of 
very interesting kind of theories. So I'm just wondering if you have any kind of suggestion or explanation for how we can actually combat this kind of idea of these people who all kind of don't know how to really like leave off their own beliefs and see how Trump can actually affect them in a negative way as well as the rest of us. Yeah. So one of the things that's so hard for progressives is that we tend to assume that not only are we right, but the reason that other people are wrong is they're just misinformed. And if we just tell them that, you know, Michelle Obama is a woman and that Barack Obama is a Christian and that Trump is crazy and, and that we show enough evidence that eventually they're just going to agree with us. So there's two reasons that this doesn't work. The, the first is that there's a whole coherent narrative coming from the far right in the US. And it's pretty easy to sort of adopt this and basically just live in a parallel universe. The second is that human beings aren't really rational. We make choices based on values rather than on rational argument. And, and so if you've ended up siding with Trump, it may not necessarily be a purely rational decision. It may be almost like tribal affiliation. And you're rejecting certain truths and accepting certain falsehoods because their value is consistent. And so just trying to put the truth out there isn't as useful as harnessing the truth to values. So one way to think about this is around climate change. There's a lot of people who are deeply religious who have ended up becoming opponents of climate change because there's other social values like abortion where they tend to side with the right. Coming and essentially saying, look, scientists agree climate change is real. We have to work on reducing carbon dioxide. Doesn't work. If we come in and talk about creation care, if we talk about our obligation as helping God's creation, you can end up having a very different conversation. And so I think in some ways, fact-checking has to take a back seat, and we have to spend more time understanding the values of people who've ended up siding with the right. What is it that's made them willing to accept a lot of these mistruths because they feel so frustrated or hurt by how our society is working and how do we take that seriously rather than just telling them that they're wrong? Thank you, guys. Thank you, Ethan, for being with us. We have to uh, just move to the next part, which is a closing. So uh, big claps for Thank Ethan. Thank you so much. Really happy to be with you and hope to be there next time in person. Yeah, sure. Take care, Ethan. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.